Welcome to the Short Term Show, the show about short term rentals and long term wealth, with real property owners hosting real properties who are crushing it in the vacation and short term rental space. And here's your host, Avery Carl. Come party with me, Cashflow Carl at BPCon. I'm hosting the short-term rental workshop. You can sign up for this when you sign up for BPCon. You can do that at biggerpockets.com slash events. This is October 15th, October 15th through the 17th for the event. I am speaking at two different presentations, but uh, what you're looking to sign up for is the short-term rental workshop hosted by yours truly, Cashflow Carl. The Reverend of Real Estate and Avery Carl. So the Short-Term Rental Workshop, BPCon 2023, October 15th. Sign up before it sells out. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Short-Term Show. And we've got a really cool episode for you guys this week because we know a lot of you are probably thinking about it's getting to be the season where you might want to make sure that you buy a property to cost seg. Well, not necessarily make sure, but you might be thinking about doing that. You might be looking at what you've made this year at your uh, other job and thinking, oh, I need to offset what I'm going to have to pay in taxes on this somehow. So I have two of the absolute experts, the top two in their fields, both related to cost seg and taxes, Yona Weiss and Amanda Hahn. I, of course, am your host, Avery Carl. Um, Amanda, we will start with you. You want to introduce yourself and just give a little background really quick? Oh, sure. Well, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I'm glad to be back. My name is Amanda Hahn. And uh, what I tell people is, I am a CPA by day and real estate investor by night. So like many of you in our audience, um, I also invest in real estate. Uh, but our company, Keystone CPA, we focus on helping real estate investors on uh, how to use real estate to reduce your overall taxes. And that's why I love being here because um, the short-term rental tax loophole is probably one of our favorite strategies uh, for investors who maybe are still working a full-time job at a high W-2 income, but doing real estate on the side. So excited to dive into all those details. And she's being modest, but Amanda has two really great books. Why don't you tell them what they're called? So if they want to learn more about taxes and real estate investing, they can pick those up. Yes, of course. So first, just to let you guys know, contrary to popular belief, our books are actually very fun to read. Uh, the first one we wrote is called Tax Strategies for the Savvy Real Estate Investor. Um, and then we wrote a second edition, which is the Advanced Tax Strategies. Um, I believe in the advanced one is where we talk a little bit more about cost segregation um, and other things like that. So um, yeah, I've had people tell me that uh, they loved our book so much that they brought it on vacation with them. They read it at the beach. Their family and friends make fun of them. But nonetheless, that gives you an idea how exciting our tax book is. Um, it really has very little tax codes, numbers, calculation. It's a lot of just us sharing client stories on how they can save taxes when they do tax planning effectively using the right strategies, but also some tax planning nightmares on when people do things incorrectly as well. Um, and you can find that on Bigger Pockets, Amazon, or anywhere books are sold. Awesome. Beach reading. You have Danielle Steele and Amanda Hahn. I love it. <laughs> All right, Yona, let's hear from you and introduce yourself to our audience. You're probably, they're probably familiar with you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me again on the podcast, Avery. It's such a pleasure. Love the short-term shop. And like Amanda, I am also a well, not a CPA, but a cost segregation expert. That's what I do my full-time job. But the rest of the time, I mean, besides for playing on social media, most of the time where you can find me, I'm a real estate investor as well. And so having that uh, behind us and, and kind of giving our perspective into not just providing a service for our clients, but also understanding it in you know from the weeds itself and knowing how important this is, I think gives such an incredible perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you guys so much for being here because I know you're both really, really busy. So Yona, let's start with you. We're going to go through a few quick definitions. Uh, if you have further questions about 
other than the definitions about cost seg in general. We've got a previous episode with Yona where we go into it in detail, but we're going to just kind of hit the high points real quick. So Yona, what is a cost segregation analysis and why would somebody do that? Absolutely. Cost segregation analysis or cost segregation study is a way to break down the depreciation of the property into different categories and allow you to accelerate some of those depreciation deductions to the earlier. So before we like get too caught up in the weeds, let's kind of take a step back and understand depreciation because I think in order to understand cost seg, which the cool kids call it, you need to understand depreciation because it's confusing because you think it depreciate like it sounds negative right um somebody's going down in value i don't want that i don't want my property to go down in value but you have to remember this it's just a borrowed term okay depreciation means that something goes down in value but from a tax perspective and real estate perspective it's a borrowed term meaning it's a tax deduction from your income taxes when you buy a property you're allowed to literally write off the entire value of that property, okay? Besides for the land, the land doesn't have value. Cost segregation is just an advanced form of that, allowing you to increase the deductions of certain components of the property in the earlier years. So it used to be called component depreciation, which makes a lot more sense saying the building structure depreciates on this longer 27 and a half or 39 year schedule for short-term rentals. But there are other components like the furniture and appliances and fixtures and all that kind of stuff, even flooring or cabinets, countertops, all that depreciates on a five-year schedule, a much faster schedule. So think about it like this, cost segregation. If someone asks you, what's a cost segregation study? It's a cash flow mechanism that allows you to take bigger tax deductions in the earlier years of ownership. All right, Amanda, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I love the way Yuna described it because that's a common confusion area we come across when talking to clients. We'll say, hey, you know, you have a very high W-2 income. Excuse me. So maybe you want to buy a short-term rental this year and we're going to create this tax loss and you're going to, you know, utilize that to offset your income for tax purposes. Um, And I think investors get a little bit anxious or scared. Like, why am I going to have loss, right? I, I, I want to invest for profit. Um, and so I, as just to reiterate the way that you know described it, you know, from a tax planning perspective, our goal, of course, as an investor is to make money. So we want cash flow, we want appreciation, but then the IRS allows us to have this paper write-off called depreciation so that we can use it just on tax returns to offset the income, but it's not really actually losing money. So we can take depreciation regardless of whether our property is actually increasing in value or decreasing in value. So in the last couple of years, of course, what we've seen is Uh, real estate values have gone up, but that doesn't impact our ability to still take that paper loss every year on our tax returns. Okay, great definition. Thank you, guys. Very easy to understand. Y'all are both great at making difficult like tax stuff easy for the rest of us to understand. So there are a few things that that have to happen for a person to be able to take advantage of this. And what are those things, Amanda? Um, so in terms of, well, maybe just to take a step back, when we talk about short-term rental loophole, um, it's really important for people to understand that if you're someone who invests in short-term rentals, it is treated very differently than people who invest in long-term rental properties. Um, what you typically hear people talk about are re- with respect to long-term rentals. And the way long-term rentals work is if you're of higher income, and for this purpose, we're talking about anyone who has over $150,000 of income. So if you have higher income and you own long-term rentals and we use this wonderful cost segregation strategy that Yona helps us with, and we create a big tax loss. Generally, you're not able to use that loss against your other income, like W-2s or if you have a business. Um, And that's kind of the big limitation. You know, you can only use it if you or your spouse is a real estate professional. And for that purpose, it's really difficult because you effectively have to spend more time in real estate than your job. So if you're someone who's working high income in medical field or in tech, almost impossible to reach that. Um, Short term rentals, on the other hand, um, we call it a loophole because you don't have to be a real estate professional. In fact, if you invest in short term rentals, we don't even care how many hours you're working at your job at all. That's irrelevant in determining whether you can use these tax losses and write offs against W-2 income. What we do care about is material participation. Um, In the most simplistic form, it's looking at what you're doing with respect to your short term rentals and how many hours you're spending in your short-term rental property. So if you and your spouse or your spouse meet the material participation hours, 
then that's where you kind of get that magical uh, combination of creating tax losses on the short-term rental side and being able to use it to offset your W-2 income from or income from your business, even if real estate investing is not your full-time job and just a side hustle. And so what, how many hours do we have to spend managing that property or or in real estate in order to be able to take advantage of of material participation? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's actually seven different ways to qualify for material participation, um, but I'll talk about three of them today only because these three are what we see in 99% of clients that we work with nationwide. Um, so the first one is kind of like the gold standard we like for our clients to use, which is the 500 hours. So if you are spending 500 hours on your short-term rentals, and it's just not just one property, if you have multiple, you can actually group them all together. So if you have 500 hours on your short-term rentals, then that's it. You've met material participation. The hours test is January 1 to December 31, right? So for the whole calendar year, it doesn't have to be like monthly or weekly, the same amount, it's just for the whole year. Um, If you can't meet 500, another way to qualify is if you spend at least 100 hours on your short-term rentals and nobody else has more time than you. So when we talk about the other people, common people that we always think of is the cleaning crew, the gardeners, the landscapers, the repair guys. If you have a property management company, that's also the other people, right? So in our scenario, Avery has 110 hours. Each of those other people only have 90 hours. So we've met material participation. Again, why do we care? Because then we can use the short-term rental losses against W-2 and other business income. Um, If you don't meet either of those two, the third one that we see generally, closer to year-end acquisitions, um, is you have any number of hours, but that's more than everybody else combined. So we'll use Avery as another example. Avery spend um, 90 hours, and then we look at the other people, the cleaning people, the repair guy, they've only spent collectively 60 hours. Now Avery also has met material participation. So any one of those three will then allow you to use short-term rental losses against W-2 and other income. So when we get to Q4 of a year, typically we're seeing people need to meet that number three <laughs> because they're crunching it into the end of the year. So 500 is going to be really tough. 100 might be tough. Well, maybe might be able to get 100 in Q4. But I think the people who are really packing it in, like trying to close right before New Year's, uh, those people would be looking at number three probably. Yeah, number two or three are the ones we see more frequent, you know, when we get to Q4 and people are trying to use the short-term rental loophole. So um, what I typically tell people is, you know, as a property owner, you're in control of how much or how little you do, right? And so the more you can do, the better it is. If the the IRS says, hey, we need to have 100 hours, we don't want to just stop tracking at 100, right? We want to have 120. If we can get to 150, that's even better. Um, because if you're ever audited and you can't prove certain hours, then you still have a cushion of these other hours. So for Q4, it makes sense because, you know, you probably have a lot of hours and getting the property up and ready, you know, furnishing it, staging it, dealing with all the bookings, listing it, and maybe even managing it versus the other people like the cleaning crew, they might only go in there once or twice. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And this question is for both of you. So I want to do an example after this question, but how much tax savings are we talking about if we do something like this? So, I mean, let's call it, what's an easy number to work with? $500,000 property, a million dollar, I think a million is probably easier numbers, right? Yeah. I mean, I'll take that. It really de- depends. I mean, there's a, like every answer when it comes to taxes, right? right? It depends, right? Um, so it depends on a lot of things. Number one, we're talking about the property. So what type of property? Uh, number two, the location. You know, where is this? Because that's going to have a big effect on the land value, which is going to be reduced. And number three, the biggest thing is, well, what's your tax rate? You're talking about tax savings. What about you? What's your tax liability? What's your you know effective tax rate? That's going to make a big difference. So let's kind of break that down in these three levels just to give a high overview. And I'll let Amanda kind of handle the, the last one of those three, because I'm sure she can cover it a lot better. But number one, the type of property. Not every type of property is going to have equal amount. So I like to give a a general, I guess, number, which is about 20 to 30% of the tax basis. Okay. When I say tax basis, that means the purchase price minus 
the land value. Okay. Now there may be some other costs that can be added in there, closing costs, et cetera, into that, but just keep it simple, about 20 to 30% of the tax basis. Okay. That means if you buy a million dollar property, take off, you know, let's say 15% for land, we're, we're left with about, you know, $850,000. That's our tax basis, remember? And then about 20 to 30% of that. So again, 160, right? 200,000, et cetera, something around that number, that's going to be what your tax deduction is going to be okay, from cost segregation. Now, it used to be that way when we're dealing with 100% bonus depreciation, where you can take a huge lump sum of that in the first year. And we didn't really break this down too much. And I'm kind of getting ahead of myself talking about these terms, bonus depreciation. But that allows you to take a huge front-loaded deduction in the first year, okay? The second factor, which is really, really important, like I said, is the land value. I gave a, you know, a random 15% number over there, but in certain places like California where Amanda's located, it can be like 60 or 70% sometimes the land value, which is just crazy, which gives you much, much, much less depreciation overall. Whereas in the Smokies, where I know you guys are located, you know, a lot of properties there, um, in Sevier County, it's about eight to 10% is usually the land value. And so you have a much more basis to work with there. Whereas a beachfront property, you know, like in Destin or all these places, again, the land value is going to be much higher than in, in the Smoky Mountain. So that's one factor to, to consider if you're like, thinking, where can I get the most bang for my buck? Where can I get the most value from the cost seg? One thing to consider is the location because that's going to reduce uh, the land value. And then the third thing, like I said, the tax rate, like what's your tax savings? Like that's that's a huge, huge difference uh, because it's not going to make sense to do a cost seg. Number one, if you can't actually use those deductions, like Amanda talked about before, if you don't meet those material participation hours and you're you know a W-2, if you're not a real estate professional, you can't really use those deductions beyond your passive income, beyond your rental income. So it doesn't really make sense to get it done in that case. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you want to be strategic in where you're buying if you're buying for this. So for example, you know, land in Wyoming is very expensive. So I probably would not want to go buy like a one bedroom house on 2000 acres in Wyoming to do this because it's all land value and a tiny little property, right? It depends. Not necessarily. <laughs> no, because because just because you have a lot of land doesn't mean there's going to be a lot of land value. I Meaning the land value itself has a lot to do with you know the location, and so there may be the the land value itself may be very very low, and the improvements, right, the building and the land improvements, et cetera, are going to take a lot of the value. Case in point, you know we're we're talking about short term rentals here, but you know we had a client I remember years ago who bought an RV park in the middle of nowhere in Texas, like near Midland, you know, out out in the middle of nowhere, and. Um, it was like the land value that the county assessor had on it was like less than like 0.5% or something like that. So it was like the land value was was absolutely nothing, which means the improvements that they had, the land improvements, which was just like gravel and pavement, et cetera, like that was all they bought. So that, the whole, whole basis was there. Nice. So yeah, I was going to say okay. something really interesting that, um, you know, back in the days, uh, or even now, actually, I always hear investors say, hey, you know, cost segregation only makes sense for large properties, you know, apartments, commercial centers. Um, and it doesn't work for like my single family home or my short term rental in Tennessee. Um, and I think that was from just historically when it was uh, maybe more expensive to do cost segregation and we didn't have the ability to do bonus depreciation. But nowadays, especially since COVID, I feel like the cost of getting a study done has gone down a lot because uh, people like Yona can be very efficient and be able to do the studies without uh, always having to fly to the property and look at, you know, eyes on the property. And uh, because of bonus depreciation, that even smaller properties might have very large tax savings. So I was trying to think, uh, to answer your question, Avery, earlier, I was trying to think of like, okay, what's a number off the top of my head for someone who did a cost segregation? So we had a client who bought two short-term rental properties, um, about $400,000 each. So about $800,000 total purchase price. This is in California too. Like Yona said, land is fairly expensive. Um, their cost segregation, their first year depreciation was I think just under $250,000. So based on their tax rate, I think they saved about one fifty. Oh yeah, wow, two fifty okay. of first year depreciation, um, and again two single family properties, right? Not commercial real estate, not multi million dollar properties, but it just made sense if they looked at the cost of having someone to do the study 
versus the, you know, over $100,000 of taxes they were saving, that's like kind of a no brainer. Yeah, that's that's really amazing. <laughs> that it's like an amazing tool. Okay, I have another question cuz we see a lot of people buying condos. So what happens when you go to do this and you've bought a condo because what's the land value of that? How does that work? Can you even do it? Yeah, typically speaking there, and it does depend on the condo. There are, it depends on whatever your documents are going to say. But typically speaking, if you have a condo, you're not going to have any land value. I mean, you're just going to own the, you know, the basically walls in, like I like to say. Now, again, it will depend on the type of condo. If it's more like a townhome, maybe a bit, a bit different. But so you, you reduce that by not having any land value, which means the entire purchase price is going to go towards depreciation. However, on the flip side, you're also not going to have any land improvements, which is another depreciation category, you know, accelerating to 15 year and can be significant sometimes. You know, if you have a property that has a swimming pool or uh, a patio, landscaping, fencing, all that kind of stuff has great value and can be, you know, can be eligible for bonus depreciation. So it really turns out being a little bit less when you're dealing with a condo. Um, than a typical single family, but okay. um, not again. It will depend on other factors, but not not significantly less. Okay, that makes sense. I've always wondered that, and I've never. I don't think I've ever asked either of you that on text. Sometimes I have like text Amanda random things and ask, "Can you do this? Can you do that?" Um, okay, <laughs> so. Hey guys, hope you are enjoying this week's episode of The Short Term Show. We are loving it. We are loving interviewing all these guests for you guys, and we hope you're getting a lot of value out of it. And we just, we really love you guys. We love you so much that we have created a community just for you. We have a Facebook group specifically for short-term rental investors, and there are tons of great posts every day, sharing best practices, learning new things from other short-term rental investors. And we would love to see you over there. The name of the group is the same name as my book, Short-Term Rental, Long-Term Wealth. Head over and join the conversation. We look forward to seeing you over there. Thanks, guys. This episode is brought to you by Short-Term Rental Listing Advice. Join this Facebook group and post your listing to get advice from other hosts, including myself on how you can improve your listing or just post your property so you can show off. Join us at strlistingadvice.com. That's strlistingadvice.com. Uh, let's, let's talk about timing here and what has to be done. So you can't just buy a bunch of properties planning to do a cost seg and claim bonus depreciation for next year and then just not get them rented, right? You have to place them into service. So what does that mean? When does that have to be done in order to be able to do this? Um, yeah, generally uh, for short-term rentals placed in service, there's two things. It has to be advertised and available for rent. So meaning I can't just advertise in December that you can start using in January that wouldn't be sufficient. So you have to have it advertised already before the end of the year, and it has to be available for a guest to occupy before the end of the year. For best practice, what we typically tell our clients is the preference is always to have at least one guest occupy the property before the end of the year. Um, it's not you know set in stone, but the reason we recommend having at least one guest turn is because otherwise it may be a little bit harder for you to prove that it was a short-term rental and not necessarily, you know, just a long-term rental, right? Because the, the, the definition of a short-term rental from a tax perspective is a property where the average guest stay is seven days or less. Um, and this is also something really important for those of you wanting to use the loophole, because just because something is listed on Airbnb, doesn't automatically make it a short-term rental for tax purposes. We have to also look at um, the time frame of, you know, the average guest stay during the year. And I know there's a lot of people getting into like the midterm rentals, or you might have a short-term rental where the snowbirds are coming down for months at a time that can really mess with this particular strategy. If those couple of guests stretch out your average guest stay and it's no longer seven or less on average. So would it be safe to say you this kind of doesn't work if your plan is midterm, like maybe if you're buying in a market that has a 30 day minimum, like say in New York or something that this you wouldn't be able to do this? 
Yeah, because if legally, whether it's the city or your condo association says you cannot do anything 30 days or less, then clearly we can't be an average of seven days or less, right? So um, yeah, the short-term rental loophole typically doesn't apply to midterm rental investors. Again, unless it's a property where it's mostly short-term, but maybe you have like one midterm person in there for a couple of weeks, but um, you're always looking at the average guest stay for that entire year. Good to know. Good to know. And then some HOAs have seven day minimum. So even that probably wouldn't work. So it truly has to be a true short term rental. Yeah, I mean, if you can do you can do seven days or less. Right. So if all of my bookings are are seven or, you know, average to be seven, then you should be fine. Okay. All right. So. What let, now that we've kind of talked about some definitions and what everything is and what types of properties and where you want to focus, you know, places that have lower land value, what are some things that people who are probably like who maybe weren't already thinking about this before they heard this podcast and they're like, oh crap, I need to do this this year? What advice do we need to give them in terms of what they need to be doing? Um, I think the the concept of cost, well, before we go to cost segregation, what I always tell people is. Um, something Yona just mentioned earlier, right? We want to make sure that cost segregation is actually beneficial for you. So if you feel like this is a strategy that makes sense, obviously, step one is you have to buy rental real estate. If you don't purchase a short-term rental, then this is all just talking in theory and it's not really going to help you reduce tax, right? So you know which what location with the right profile, like Yona said, less land, a higher building value, um, have every help with getting the right type of property for cash flow and appreciation. The next thing is to make sure that you understand and are actually doing the right things between now and the end of the year to earn your hours. And I mean earn your hours as in actually doing those things, right? And your hours also have to be reasonable. So we can't just say, hey, it took me one whole week to put this uh, painting up on the wall when it actually just took 15 minutes or I don't know, 30 minutes, right? If you're very <laughs> accurate. Um, so just making sure, that, I mean, also the properties in the location, then you have the bandwidth to be able to go there. Or even if you're remote, that there's enough things for you to do to gather those hours. Once you know you have those hours that you've earned for material participation, then you look into actually doing a cost segregation study, and that will help benefit you for next April. Yeah, and I think just to reiterate what Anna's saying here, the first step is always have a conversation with your CPA. And this is a very, very common question almost every time on a conver- uh, you know, a, a call with a potential client from the short-term shopper from wherever, they're often, you know, plagued with the fact that number one, either they've been doing their own taxes, you know, for a while, uh, or number two, they've just had some random CPA who's like a family friend or whatever, or, you know, just doing something who doesn't understand real estate. And it's more common than not that you'll have an account that just doesn't get or doesn't understand or doesn't know the rules behind cost segregation and especially the short-term rental loophole. And so it's important to have that conversation for two reasons. Number one, to see if this is a CPA you want to continue being on with uh, or find someone who's better suit for you. Now you're pursuing more real estate. It's better to have a real estate focused CPA. And number two is, you know, if they are on board with it, just make sure that they understand the rules or they're willing to learn at least, um, you know, they can be, they can learn, they can, they can understand the rule. They're in the tax code. They just not, may not be specializing in it. So having that conversation first, just to see, like Amanda said, if this is even going to make sense for you, because, you know, if you don't have the material participation, if you don't fulfill these requirements, et cetera, et cetera, then doing the cost seg is not going to benefit you. Or on the flip side, if you do the cost seg, right? You pay whatever it's going to be to to get it done, get all these deductions. And then your accountant doesn't even know what to do with it and says, sorry, you can't apply this to your W-2. And then you're stuck with like this huge tax bill. You're like, wait, what just happened? I thought like Amanda, you know, I listened to this podcast and Avery and Yona said that I could take these huge deductions. And what happened? No. First, have a conversation with your CPA, make sure that number one, they understand it. Number two, they can apply it. And number three, if not, you know, find someone else who does. Um, can I just share a real quick nightmare story? Because I'm totally, yes. I, I'm just going through it right now. So uh, I'm talking with a new client after this today. Um, I reviewed their tax return from last year and they did all the right things, right? They had all the material participation hours. They self-managed a handful of short-term rentals, had a cost segregation. The study itself was 
phenomenal. Um, but on the tax return, their CPA didn't take bonus depreciation on any of those assets that they broke out. So they lost out on about $300,000 of assets oh. that were supposed to be claimed on bonus depreciation. Um, so I think it's just, you know, uh, we don't see this all the time, right? So don't be super alarmed, but we do see it more than we would like. So just making sure, like Yuna said, you have a team that actually understands real estate and you are not having to be the person to kind of explain the strategy or teach it to your tax advisor. Yeah, that's that's definitely not ideal. Uh, oh, one question I had from jumping back to a previous subject. A lot of people ask me, which I say, I'm not a CPA, I ask you guys, uh, does travel time count towards your hours? Because like, oh, well, I guess I'm going to drive to this property in Wyoming and that's, uh, you know, it's going to take me three days to do. Can I count all those hours? Is that allowed? That's a great question. I think if you ask three different CPAs, you'll probably get three different answers <laughs> or maybe four different answers. Um, so I think for us, the way we look at it is it depends on what you are doing uh, once you reach the destination, right? So for short-term rentals, it's a little bit more strict because we cannot count hours that we're you know, searching for properties or learning about real estate. Material participation is property specific. Um, so the way we typically tell our clients is if you're driving to you know, the Smokies because you're going there to build the furniture or you're there to repair or deal with some issue, then those hours should count. Now, if you're having to stay overnight and you're sleeping and you know you make a pit stop at a amusement park, those obviously will not count because they're not part of just you know the commute to get there. Okay, good to know. Yeah. Do you have anything? I think like like I'm gonna say the general rule is if it's strictly for business, right? If 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 you're going strictly there for the business, that's where you can definitely uh, prove those hours. And the tracking of those hours is also a really important thing. Um, you mentioned, you know, having, being able to track those hours from material participation. Do you have, Amanda, do you have any suggestions of like ways that people should be tracking their hours or best, best ways to do that? Yeah. I mean, what I always tell people, you know, best practice, one thing I mentioned earlier is reasonableness, right? So in everything you do it should be reasonable. You know, how, how long would this take another person to do something like this? Um, IRS doesn't really have a specific method that they require you to utilize. They do want consistency though. So consistency, meaning if Google Calendar is how I track it, that should be for the whole year. If I'm using Excel, that should be the whole year. Um, they really don't like it when you have a mixture of things. You know, here's some on calendar, here's some on a piece of paper. Uh, actually, one of our clients who um, is a doctor, by the way, who used the short-term rental loophole um, to try to offset her medical income, she created an app called Reps Tracker, R-E-P-S Tracker. Uh, it also, you know, it's for long-term rentals, but also has kind of a, a sister module for the short-term rental space. And so for, yeah, so for some of our clients who really like to use app, that's one to check out as well. Because um, it's on your phone, right? And you can always just toggle on and start tracking hours. We actually interviewed her. It's going to come out. That episode will come out after this one, but y'all stay tuned to uh, to hear from about that. So that's that's awesome. And I have one one thing to add on the real estate side of this is if you guys are planning to do this, get started now because once like you need to close at the latest the beginning of December and every year uh, once once we hit I think Thanksgiving, people start being out of office, people like and by people I don't mean People on my team, I mean, like other like listing agents, title companies, uh, lenders, and it can start to get really ugly the closer, like the further into December that you get, because if anything happens, like an appraisal comes in low, and so we have to extend, and maybe sometimes we have to start with a new lender if it was really wacky, and these little things that can happen in any real estate transaction start to get very, very, very stressful for you as we get every single day into December. And once we get to like December 20th, we have no idea where anybody in a deal is ever going to be and if they're going to respond. And it can get really brutal if you wait too long. And so to save yourself some stress and make sure that you get this done so that and close so that you can properly track those hours and do everything. I mean, we have every year, there's at least, I would say at least five deals across our markets that are, I'm having to call title companies on New Year's Eve and say, can you please do this right now? Real quick, I will pay you, like go to the office and, and bang this through. And um, it, it's just really, really stressful for you guys as buyers. And then you're kind of like 
skirting some rules, like some gray areas there, pushing it to the end. So make sure you get it done. I would say you want to close in November to make sure that you have plenty of time to, you've got some buffer time for any, anything wacky that can happen in a deal. And then you're able to actually concentrate on doing all of these steps that Yona and Amanda have talked about the correct way to make sure that you're following the rules here and actually going to be able to take advantage of it. So that's my recommendation is start now. <laughs> Yeah. And I just want to add something to that too, um, because, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about material participation and how that allows you to use it against W-2 and other income. Sometimes like me, investors who are kind of discouraged, you know, they're like, hey, I don't know, I'm just going to give up because I won't meet material participation this year. So something really interesting for our listeners to understand is even if you don't meet material participation this year, we can still use that same strategy next year right? It's not a one and done thing. So let's say you did in the worst case scenario, close on the property this year, you put it into service in December, late December, and you just don't have enough hours, right? For whatever reason, there's not enough hours, you can't meet it. Well, that's fine. Next year, you could still try for material participation on that property. And if as long as the property was closed and placed in service in this year, 2023, you can use this year's bonus depreciation law, even if you're doing a cost segregation next year in 2024. Um, and it's just, this is kind of a small part of the tax code that not a lot of people talk about, but I think is very important. And the reason it's important is because, um, I know Yona mentioned earlier, bonus depreciation. This year, 2023, we have 80% bonus. Next year, we go down to 60%. So as long as your property is placed in service this year, we can use 80% for the building cost segregation, even if you don't meet those hours until next year or two, three years down the road when you finally decide, hey, I'm going to spend hours on my real estate. Um, and that's why, you know, we kind of saw this frenzy last year because 2022 was 100% bonus. So we had a lot of investors go out and, and try to lock in that 100% bonus. So kind of that same theory for this year to try to lock in 80% bonus rather than getting the 60% next year. Yeah. And that is kind of a bummer that it's it's going down. But there is, uh, we mentioned before we, we started recording, there is a, a law making its way or a bill making its way through uh, the government right now about maybe retroactively making that back to 100%. Uh, what do you guys know about that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's, uh, like you said, well, first of all, let's take a step back, just if if we can, just to explain the bonus okay. depreciation 100%, because I think it's a really important thing. As I mentioned earlier, before 2017, 2018, when this bill came about, conservation was really relegated to much higher, you know, commercial properties, you know, over a million dollar purchase price, et cetera. It just made much more sense. But because of this 100% bonus depreciation, which allowed you to take 100% of those accelerated deductions, remember the five year, the 15 year depreciation, all up front in the first year is a lump sum. So instead of like a, you know, a $30,000 deduction a year for like a million dollar property, you're getting like, you know, $150,000, $200,000 deduction in the first year. That was huge. And so it made a huge difference for even properties, you know, for $200,000, $300,000 purchase price and above made a lot more sense. But when that bill was introduced, it started to, you know, had in 2023, it's going to start to sunset this year. If you buy a property 2023, it's now 80%, 60% next year. But as, as you mentioned, alluded to, there was a bill that was passed in the house uh, a few months ago that included the restoration of 100% bonus depreciation. However, it obviously needs to go through all the channels of the government, you know, Congress passed the past, the president has to sign on it, et cetera. So it may take a while uh, to see that maybe a change in administration might uh, make 100% bonus depreciation come back, uh, but we, uh, I guess we'll see. All right. Well, that's something maybe to look forward to, to be hopeful about. Um, so is there anything that we haven't touched on that you guys think would be really valuable for our listeners to hear about this topic? Um, you know, I think for me, uh, one of the things I always talk with clients about this time of the year, as we head into year in planning is to take a look at where your numbers are, right? How much income did I make on my, on my job, on my business? Um, and then what are the all what are all the strategies you can utilize to offset your income, whether it's retirement contributions or short-term rental loophole? Um, and then really just being able to pull the trigger sooner rather than later. You know, like what you were saying earlier, Avery, you don't want to be stuck in starting to look in December 
and really, you know, having to find a, a really bad deal or just not being able to get everything in on time. One way to look at it is, would I would I rather pay money to the IRS or would I rather put that as a down payment on a rental property? Right. We know when you pay to taxes, the, the ROI is zero. Right. I mean, we're going to get good roads and, and bridges and all that, of course. But um, if I'm going to put this as a down payment towards a short term rental property or any rental property, then there is going to be some sort of return on investment. Right? So that's typically, um, you know, people are trying to think, OK, is this the best use of my funding? That's one way to take a look at the different options. Yeah. All right. Well. Uh, Yona, do you have anything to add before we go? Yeah, just a couple short things, a very, very common questions that I get, which is, you know, when does this need to get done by? So it does take us to do the full cost seg about six weeks or so to, to turn it around. But we always like to run a free upfront analysis. So you can reach out to me. Uh, we, it takes about a day or so just to run those numbers. You can bring it back to your CP, have that conversation. But it does not need to be done. The cost does not need to be completed before the end of the calendar year. I know a lot of people are concerned. Well, if I have the property, it's going to be time to do the cost seg. Don't worry. You have until your tax filing date. So just don't wait until, you know, March 1st or, you know, April 1st, whatever your tax filing is to get the cost seg done, you know, but you do have time uh, as we get towards the end of the year. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for coming on. Uh, before we go, if any of our listeners want to find you guys, follow you guys, give you a holler to ask you some questions uh, or hire you, where can they do that? Uh, for me, the best place uh, is our company website. It's keystonecpa.com. And if some of the things that we talked about today are new to you, um, definitely take advantage of our free downloadable tax savings toolkit. We have a whole section that's dedicated to the short-term rental loophole. Um, and we also have a, you know, a, a tool for long-term rental investors. Um, we also have a risk barometer, which is a self-assessment tool that allows you to see or gauge what your risk might be in terms mm -hmm. of overpaying in taxes. So that's keystonecpa.com. And um, if you're just, you know, looking for daily tax tips, the best place to find me is on Instagram as Amanda Han CPA. Awesome. Right. And you can find me on all the socials. I'm very active uh, in the short-term, you know, shop Facebook group. Uh, I'm very active on LinkedIn, Instagram as well, Twitter. Or you can just go to our website, madisonspecs.com, our company Madison Specs, uh, or yonawice.com if you want to check out more of what I'm up to. Yeah. And Yona also has a great podcast called Weiss Advice. So definitely check that out. All right. Thank you guys so much. We'll catch you later.